Amen. Thanks. I needed that. So speaking of prayer requests, praying for people, I have an announcement uh, from our brother Stuart Spradling, uh, Nora Lee Spradling, born May 25th, six pounds, five ounces. Mom did great. Nora caught a little infection on the way out and is needing extra help figuring out how to breathe. So she's in a NICU right now. Okay. So let's be praying for baby Nora and our family the Spradlings. Amen. Let's pray for healing and recovery. God, we, um, we thank you so much, Lord, that you prayed for us. Um, Lord, we're very grateful. I love that. We'll, uh, we'll cover that in the book of John, Father. We see you praying for us in John 17. And uh, we're, Lord, you didn't have to, but um, you sure did. And, and even now, Father, the Bible says you are our intercessor, God. You are uh, constantly praying for us. Your Holy Spirit Praise and wordless groans, it says in Romans 8. And uh, so we're very grateful that in your Trinity, Lord, there is a part of you that uh, contends for us in prayer. And so we ask, Father, to, to, for you to hear us as we join you in prayer uh, for our family, uh, for Stu and Emily, uh, for, for uh, the other two girls, God. It's so, so awesome, God, to have a third daughter. Lord, we pray for baby Nora, God, is, you know, just help her, help her, God, to uh, fight the infection. God, please uh, be with the physicians. Lord, we're very grateful for modern medicine. Um, it's, it's amazing, Lord, what you've allowed us to do through science uh, in the past couple hundred years. And uh, we're very grateful, God, that we have those blessings. But ultimately, we know that uh, you are in control. You are the great physician. There is no healing. There is no recovery without you. So we call on you, Lord, to, to be their help, to be our help, to be, you know, to be their uh, savior in this sense, Lord. We need you to save uh, all of us, God, physically, spiritually, all the time. And we just pray, God, you just do um, your work, Father, to, to heal uh, baby Nora in this time, God. We lift them up to you. We pray that they uh, can have peace, especially as parents. For Stu and Emily, help them to have peace as they uh, honestly just wait on you. God, this is, uh, this is what it means uh, in one sense to be human, is to wait on the Lord. And so we pray, Father, that as they wait, you show yourself to be the Lord uh, in their lives and in their daughter's life as well. God, we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I mean, let's keep praying for our family. Amen? Yeah. All right. Um, we also got, uh, just wrapped up our yearly ministers and training program, for those of you that don't know. So for a week, our church hosted about 25 college students from around the region, and they had Bible and leadership classes every morning. And then we sent them around town to preach the gospel. And they pretty much every night they had little small groups or Bible, uh, Bible talks. They led themselves. And on Friday, Melissa and I, it was about a week long, Friday to Friday. And so this past Friday, Melissa and I met with each of them essentially for some individual exit interviews, <laughs> reviews, you may say. And they had nothing but great things to say about the church here and their host families. Um, you guys just did an amazing job. They felt so loved by you guys. So I want to thank every family that hosted students. Uh, they felt loved, man. We had a great time on Wednesday, so thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The church here has always stepped up in that way to be so hospitable. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the group just felt loved, and that's what we want, right? And I also want to thank Nate and Hazel, who uh, helped lead our campus ministry. Yeah. They were up here every morning before everybody else, getting breakfast ready for, uh, for, these ki for, the, for the students, uh, get picking up and ordering meals, running slideshows. Logistically, they, they pretty much just did everything to make everything happen. So thank you guys as well. It's pretty thankless work, but thank you for being servants. Amen? So, uh, but with everything going on, right, we had Mother's Day, and then we had Jeff Henderson come in from Wichita. Uh, who taught a class at MIT, he preached here last week, right? So we took a break from the Gospel of John the past few Sundays. And uh, our theme, right, this year has been going through the Gospel, yeah. and specifically the Gospel of John, his Gospel. And our sub-theme, right, we've gone through four different sub-themes through the year. And our sub-theme for this quarter has been the life, how Jesus is, is, is truly, he, he helps life be what it is. And all of its goodness and all of the trials, there's life with Jesus. The first part of John, we focus on how Jesus was the light, right? He's the light of the world. Interestingly enough, 
In John 8, Jesus reminds us that he's the light. So there's going to be, going to be a little bit of overlapping those two concepts, the light and the life. I was, going, I was in the back with Daniel working on slides for this. And he was like, are you, so are we talking about the life or the light? Like, I'm confused. I'm like, both, brother. Right? Both. We're talking about both today because Jesus is somewhat talking about both. And in this, so in this case, right, we're talking about how the light gives us second chances. And in life, see how me and Daniel kind of had this dialogue. With the life, light, life, light, right? In life, we need second chances, don't we? All the time. We just need it. We need forgiveness. Otherwise, we just can't function. Pity the man that tries to survive without forgiveness in his life. And I think sometimes, in one sense, that's why you see society functioning as dysfunctionally as it does because we don't know how to forgive. We don't know how to forgive ourselves. We don't know how to forgive each other. We just don't understand the radical magnitude of a second chance sometimes. So today we'll see how Jesus, the light of the world, helps us live life because he gives us second chances. Amen? John chapter 8, verse 12. We're going to do a little bit of reading this morning, okay? In the Bible here, it says, uh, uh, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your Father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. What I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. We have two points about the light. Who is Jesus? The light is what gives us second chances. The first point is the light won't give up. The light will not give up. Here he calls himself the light of the world, which is one of seven I am statements that Jesus makes about himself in the Gospel of John. Each I am statement captures a different dimension of the kind of Lord and Savior Jesus is. To me, this I am statement is one of the most comforting, isn't it? Why the world? Because I think we've all known what it's like to be in the dark. I think we all know what that's like. It could be knowing that we're in a dark place spiritually or emotionally. It could just be knowing that, man, I just feel like I need to get right with God. There's something that just feels off in my soul. It could be feeling like we just don't know where to go with our lives. We may feel like, man, me and God, I, I, I don't know. Where are, we, where are you taking me right now? The trials and Challenging circumstances may have made us feel like at times we might as well be in the dark. Most of us can probably relate to feeling like we've been in the dark at some point in our lives. 
Jesus makes this statement of I am the light of the world in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was being celebrated in Jerusalem at this time. This is, if you go back to the beginning of John 8 and John 7, right, Jesus goes up for this feast, and this was the Feast of Tabernacles. This feast commemorated how in the book of Exodus, God showed up as a pillar of fire that gave light to Israel as they made their way out of the promised land. You guys remember that, right? They escaped from Egypt, and as they're leaving, right, Pharaoh was hot on their tracks. God goes, hey, if you, I'm going to show up as a light. Actually, let's, let's read Exodus here. Exodus 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Don't you love that about God? He knows us. He's like, they're not soldiers yet. If they find resistance, they will just go back to slavery. So we're going to go that way, right? God just always knows. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. This is who God's been to his people. Even in the midst of challenging situations, God said, I can give you light. And you just got to follow me. I'll make sure you don't face battles that I know you will run away from. But I will lead you to battles that I know you can face. I love that about God. Unfortunately, right, after Israel escaped from Egypt, we know that, right? We've seen the prince of Egypt, hopefully. We know how this plays out. They traveled to the edge of the promised land, and even they refused to enter it because they were scared of its inhabitants, the Nephilim. They're probably, every seven-footer you see today is probably descendant from the Nephilim. And they were scared of them, even though God said, don't be scared, I'll be with you, you can take them. But they said, no, 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 God, we, we, we just don't trust you. As a result, God made that generation of Israelites wander the desert for 40 years. God's people were given the light at one time, and they refused to follow it. Of course, we know that after 40 years, God gave them another chance to be in the promised land, and they learned from their mistakes, and they entered it. But even after entering the promised land, there were many times they forgot about their God. And now, after several centuries of being subservient to one empire after another that took over the promised land because they refused to trust in God, God was giving them another chance to follow his light. This time, he goes, I'm going to come as, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send my son. He is going to be, in your, uh, be your light. And yet, even in the first part of this passage, they have the nerve to question Jesus. They question and critique him. Verse 21, right, they have one dialogue, and there's an implication, if you read verse 21, that in one sense he comes back another day during the feast. It's like, you know what, they didn't listen to me that day. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to preach again to these guys. And once again, he engages these same people who are critical and judgmental of his ministry. By the end of it, he still preaches to them. Verse 25, they go, who are you? Like, what are you talking? Who am I? You know who I am. And yet he keeps engaging them. The light does not give up. The light never stops trying to help people out of the darkness. How has Jesus never given up to help you see the light? How has Jesus persevered and never stopped engaging you, even when you've questioned his judgment? There are so many times I've questioned 
Jesus' love for me. I've questioned his judgment. I've questioned the circumstances I've had to live through. And I've thought to myself, what, 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 how, can you, God, how, can you, how can this be the light? You're leading me into darkness right now. There's so many times I've questioned Jesus, even though he's the only one who's died for my sin. Verse 25, right? We see that. that, that I, I think in many ways I can ask that question. Maybe not, you know, uh, literally, but I can ask that question. Who are you? Who are you? To think the nerve to ask that question. But I've asked that. It's as if myself and the Israelites, and maybe if we can relate to this, it's as if we've, we've, we're totally choosing to ignore all that he's done and said for each of us up to this present hour. And yet Jesus is so persistent. He keeps preaching to them. He keeps dialoguing with them. He keeps uh, engaging them to the point where by the end of this passage in verse 30, a few of them are starting to believe in him. Some are starting to believe in what he has to say. I love that about Jesus. He's just persistent. He's perseverant. How has Jesus just kept loving you despite your doubts? How has Jesus kept showing you grace after grace after example of grace to where maybe even today he might just finally get you to believe in his power and goodness? Now, I'd be remiss, of course, to, to not mention that today's Memorial Day. It can be easy to think of Memorial Day as an extra day off, chance to have a cookout or a long weekend, which I know, you know, that we all should partake in that, amen? But we know the heart of the day is to honor men and women who've died while serving in the armed forces to protect, namely, our religious freedoms. I stumbled, man, you guys may have heard this quote, right? Home of the free because of the brave. Because of the brave. You know, as a member of the Columbia Church throughout the years, right, uh, became a Christian here in 2006, I've had many a great Memorial Day weekends, lots of great memories. For a handful of years, we've driven up to St. Louis on the Sunday, right, uh, on, on, on these Sundays um, to have what we lovingly call with our sister church there our luau service, right? And uh, if you don't know what that is, we drive up to St. Louis, we wear floral print shirts and dresses, we put on lays. We have lunch together, and we close our eyes, and we imagine we're in Hawaii. That's what we do. <laughs> and it's muggy, and it's like, I don't think it's muggy in Hawaii. But anyways, let's close our eyes. We have on lay. This is the closest we're going to get to Hawaii, amen? And it's a great time. It's awesome. The last year, we've, roasted, we've actually roasted a pig there. I mean, it's been great. Those are the experiences I've gotten to have as a disciple of Jesus on my memorial days. Love those road trips, getting up early and driving up there. You know, this, the, the ministry and training program we just had, right? Speaking of that, we've had years where the program was three weeks, not one week. So after that service in St. Louis, sometimes we'd take the students away. And I was a student at one point, and we'd go to the lake for a few days just to get away and bond. We glamp by the water. So I certainly wasn't camping, so, you know. Those have been some of the experiences I've been able to have. You know, just I get to have a luau service in the middle of the Midwest, and it's fun. It's awesome. There's bounce houses now. My kid gets to have these experiences. But men and women have died so that I could have the freedom to worship freely. So praise God for that. But on a deeper level, I think we know someone else died so that we could have all these things. So that none of us would have ever had to stay in darkness. You know, um, the ability that I have to be in the light transcends being in America. If I lived in a different country, I would not have to stay in darkness. We had our brothers and sisters. We had uh, Sergei, right, who leads yeah. the Moscow church here a few months ago, <laughs> preaching on Good Friday. You can, we can live in the light in Moscow. Yeah. Even in the midst of political tension and turmoil, our brothers and sisters would welcome us in open arms yeah. in Moscow. I could be in the light, in St. Petersburg, in Krasnoyarsk, in, you know, in Siberia. 
because of Jesus. I can follow the light regardless of where I live. My life can constantly be in the light of Jesus because the light does not give up. How is Jesus not giving up on you even right now? Even right now, he is trying to chisel away at your character. And if you're anything like me, you're like, no, stop it. Enough with the chisel. Because character development, especially spiritual character development, what does what the Bible say in Hebrews, right? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. My wife chuckled because we're training Ruth to memorize that passage right now, okay? No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Ruth, say it again. Ruth, say it again. But painful. But in the end, in the end, it produces a harvest of righteousness for those trained by it. How is God trying to discipline you? Even in this moment, he doesn't have to. You know, he could. I, I, we see in the in, in the Bible in the Old Testament, there was a time God saw his people and were like, "I'm done disciplining you, at least face to face. I'm going to give you over. I'm going to give you over to Babylon. I'm going to give you over to the Assyrians, and my discipline for you will come through them now. If that's how you want to do it, brothers and sisters." How is God trying to chase each of us down right now and persevere with us? Think of all the good things you've experienced. Maybe it's not, many, many of us here is a luau service, right? Maybe you're like, I've never had to pretend like I've been in Hawaii, which, you know, amen for that, right? But think of all the good things you've experienced because Jesus has never stopped giving you chances to make different choices. I want to challenge Each of us, that all of that comes back to the light, to Jesus, never giving up. You know, at this point, perhaps if our belief in this was shaky this morning, maybe we're on more solid ground. Amen. Maybe we believe even that Jesus still loves us and still believes in us despite the ways we've messed up or made mistakes. Let's keep reading. Jesus continues in his words for the audience and I believe for us. John 8, verse 31. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, says so finally a few believed him, right, at this point. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you were looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you, what you, I've seen in my father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. These are fighting words, as they say, right? We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, are we right in saying that you are Samaritan and demon-possessed? So they're just like, oh, no, 
uh, oh, well, you are, you are Samaritan. You are half-breed, man, if you're going to go there, right? And, and you got to have a demon. I mean, it's, just, it's getting dicey at this point, right? Now, you, you could probably cut the tension with a knife, right? If we were there, you'd be like, oh, Jesus, what are you going to say now? What does he say? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus. <laughs> like, amen. But I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. I'm not going to keep reading this. By the end of this, they are trying to stone Jesus. I mean, it just gets more intense. The light won't give up, and the light won't change. The light won't change. It's very clear, right, when we read this. Jesus just doesn't give up on people. He also never changed his expectations. He never changed his love, but he never changes his expectations. And he never changes who he is. Here's the, this is the challenging part. Jesus issues this challenge to the Jews who believed him. Like, these are the people who are somewhat favorable to Jesus. He goes, oh, you believe in me now. Good. Okay, now we can really talk. To the Jews who had believed, he said, hold to my teachings. Then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free, which is why Jesus came, to give us freedom. Until then, Jesus is saying, we're slaves to sin. Until the truth sets us free, we are slaves to our sin. And this just triggers this audience like nobody's business. Like, how dare you? Are you saying we're slaves? We're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves. We're, the, we're God's chosen people. And they go back to their lineage, their traditions, their, their religious, their religiosity. Like, we've been chosen. Don't you know who I'm descended from, right? And that's, that's where it gets tricky, right? With modern religion today, we make it about, oh, I, I've gone to church. I grew up in church. Right. Like, man, you know, okay, good. Are, 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 have you lived church since then? Jesus will not back off just because we say platitudes like I grew up in church. He challenges us. He then challenges this spiritual connection, this assumed spiritual connection to Abraham. He basically says, you may be physically descended from Abraham, but you are not his spiritual children. And to say that to Jews, you are asking to be killed. And they already knew they were trying to kill him. It's like Jesus pours gasoline on this fire. He's like, well, I already know you're trying to kill me, so here we go. By the end of this passage, we didn't read this, the Jews are asking him, do you think you're greater than Abraham? And Jesus, the famous words, he was, before Abraham was born, I am. Wow. Which, I mean, that's a connection to Exodus, right? Yeah. God says, I am. Yeah. If, you, if you were an Old Testament reading Jewish person, you knew the connection he was making. Sure. And, of course, it's, you're saying, blasphemy. He's, he's a carpenter. No way can a carpenter be the Messiah. I mean, he very clearly, sta he's stating here, a claim to deity. I'm God. From the beginning, Jesus says, I'm Lord of all or Lord of nothing at all. Jesus, I'm not changing. I, I, will not, I will not stop chasing you, but I'm not changing. The Jews start trying to stone him. He's like, I, I don't care if you try to stone me. I'm not changing. The light will not give up on us. He'll always give us Chances to change, but Jesus himself will not change anything about himself or his message. You know, Jesus gives us second chances, not just so that we can feel better about our consciences for a day or a week or a month. I used to go to church doing that growing up. Like, I, I, I'm going to go to church and I just want to feel better. After a weekend of doing whatever I wanted, I'm going to go to church because I'm going to feel better. And I feel great about myself for a week, maybe two weeks if I'm lucky. 
until I inevitably went back to the slavery of my sin. Parties, alcohol, chasing women, impurity. Even though I believed, like these Jews, I believed. And I went to church. I was still a slave to my sin. Why aren't we tired of that? We all, at some point, many of us here, we grew tired of that. We're like, I can't do this anymore. I can't just go to church just to feel good. Like I'm, but I'm still actually, nothing about my spiritual condition has actually changed. Jesus does not give me or any of us second chances to stay in that cycle. And praise God for that. He gives us second chances. So we all can take leaps of faith and actually follow God and experience freedom from our sin. This morning, are we just here to feel good about ourselves because we went to church? Do we show up to small groups or Bible talks because we know we're supposed to? Or are we here because we remember we have stumbled upon Mount Zion, as it says in Hebrews 13, the city of the living God? Are we here because we're actually trying to learn more about Jesus? Who claims to be the light of the world and claims that by holding to his teachings, we actually can experience freedom. Even if we go to jail, we'll be free. Isn't that crazy? Paul wrote many of the New Testament letters from jail. As I would say, we would all feel like that guy was freer than most people we'll ever meet. Where are we this morning? Are we just believers? There's a lot of confusion in the religious world about this term because for many of us, we grew up thinking as long as we believe, Jesus is cool with that. When we read this, we see that for Jesus, we want, he wants us to believe, but we also must obey. It's not just thinking, oh, I believe conceptually that that's the light. That's the light. Jesus goes, I'm glad you think I'm the light. Now I need you to follow me. Because you can believe I'm the light all you want. Until you follow me and obey me out of the dark, you will be in the dark. That's the whole point of the light. I can't just be like, oh, that's, that'd be, that's a good idea. I should follow. I think he's the light. I'm not going to follow that. And I'm like, that, you, you, be, you look at me like, you, are you crazy? There's your chance to get out of jail, man. In what areas of our lives are we compromising our obedience to Jesus? You know, this passage is challenging. Verse 31, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, sometimes, guys, life jades us, doesn't it? We get cynical, and we start, the truth starts to get muddied. Our convictions about God start to get muddled because perhaps there's some scriptures we've stopped saying, man, I am going to obey. I'm going to be open about my sin with the family, with my, the, the, my closest brothers, my, the, the, for the sisters, with my closest sisters. I'm going to be open about my sin. We stop doing that. The truth starts getting muddied. The, 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 the church is meeting together. Oh, I don't have to be there. The truth starts getting muddied. When we start to lose, stop, start, start having a, a, a loss of conviction that we need to be together because we stop seeing each other. I don't have to pray. I don't have to read my Bible. We start thinking those things. We stop being consistent with being in our Bibles. Guys, we get disconnected from God's voice. The truth gets muddied when we're not reading our Bibles. All these things, are just, Jesus is literally saying, hey, I'm the light if you do what I do and you do what I say. Do we believe that if we hold to Jesus' teachings, we can actually live a more peaceful, impactful, and fuller life? That we may, at some time, we're going to be, we're going to be more challenged. We're going to be more sacrificial. Yeah. We're going to be more generous. We're probably going to be more tired. Because right? we're giving of ourselves. Do we believe that even as we give, we'll actually be fuller? What does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians? Hard pressed but not crushed. Hard pressed but not crushed. Struck down but not destroyed. 
The Bible is full of those assurances that if we obey Jesus, we transcend our circumstances. If anything, Jesus uses our circumstances to impact those around us. You know, I want to share this, and we'll close out here. Uh, Jeff, right, from Wichita, preached here last Sunday. He taught one of the classes for the college students this past week. And in his class, he mentioned, some of you guys may know the statistic, this number one, the number one cause of death for the age ranges of 18 through 35 in the United States is suicide. Here we are in the United States. Greater access to health care, information about health care, informa information about mental health. We have, we, have, we have so much access to all of this stuff, right? To luxuries and comforts that would have seemed alien to our ancestors. Last night, my wife wakes me up at 1 o'clock. She's like, I hear, I hear this sound in the kitchen. I think cicadas. Like, cicadas in the kitchen? Like, no, no way. So we go down there, and we hear this sss. I'm like, what is that? That might be a cicada in the kitchen, right? So it's behind the fridge. So we, we're, we're moving it. I'm like, oh, I'm like half asleep. I'm like, what is going on back here, right? I'm like, thinking, I'm like so this is an alien? Like, what's happening? Is this Stitch from Lilo and Stitch? I'm like, sss. so I'm like, what is this, right? I'm trying to, trying to flash so I can't see anything. I turn, we, open, we pull it back, and it's the, it's the water going up to make the, to, to make the ice. It's, and it's leaking water. And, it's, and, I was, and I was just so grumpy. I turn it like, ugh. This stupid fridge. Ah, oh, it's so hot in here. Why does the AC cost so much? Like, ah, oh. like I'm just, I'm just so grumpy. I'm so just, just, just angry. I'm like, ah, oh, now I gotta move this fridge back that makes ice out of nothing, you know? And, and I go, and my wife's like, why are you gotta be such a grouch? I'm like, I don't know. And I makes me think, I'm like, man, I have, a, I have air conditioning. I have a fridge that makes ice. Like a hundred years ago. This would have been like, dude, you got it pretty good. Yeah. I wish I was waking up at 1 o'clock to, to, to complain about the AC. I could just hit a few times. It'd be as, as cold as I wanted to be. And, and you'd have ice coming out of a, a box. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd be really nice. Someone 100 years would be like, you're living a really good life. Yeah. Here we are in the United States. We experience all this. Yeah. And yet, you know, we're... we're Literally, we are so far in the darkness, we're so unaware of how dark we are, so much so that many of my peers, I turned 38 in October, many of my peers in my age group took their lives because we as a people can't find our way out of the darkness. Family, let's not fool ourselves. We are not that smart. We are not that sophisticated. We got it really good. We need check second chances. We need Jesus. We need the light. We need God's mercy. And we still need to take those check second chances and do our best to obey Jesus. This, this morning, right, what's, what are the commands, right? Like, man, I, brother, this command has been challenging. Read, commit yourself to that scripture. What's one command from Jesus that you know you need to refocus on? Maybe you don't even know which command to look for. You're like, Janice, I don't know where to start in the Bible. I think it's probably like 10 or 50 of them. I don't know. I've been in that situation before. If you are, man, sit down and study the scriptures with somebody here. Amen? Because the gospel is all about second chances. The light came to the world to help us recover our sight. The light never gives up, but it also never changes. Let's follow the light together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, brother. It was very convicting. Second chances, um, you know, we think about them sometimes, but for the most part, I know I take them for granted. Um, but the light, you know, we sang that song earlier where he says, uh, as I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. When I stumble in the darkness of my sin, most of the time I don't call his name by night. And I think we not only need to remember these lessons, you know, we sing a lot of songs that we don't really remember the words or why we're singing them, um, but I, I wrote down a few things here, <clears throat> you refuse to follow the light. I've been around a few blind people in my life. My father went blind when I was seven. There was a brother in St. Louis, Lanny Samuels, he led the Little Rock Church for a while. Um, there's a sister there now that 
in St. Louis that plays keyboard. She's blind. It would be like them saying, no, I'm not going to follow where you lead me. I'm going to go my own way. And that's what I do, you know, when, and when I just refuse to follow the light. Um, question Jesus' decisions for my life. Many times I've questioned his decisions for my life. Why did you do this? Why did you do Why? What are you doing this for? Um, what's the lesson I'm supposed to be learning here? <laughs> um, there's an old Seinfeld episode. He goes into a get rental car, and they had, he had had a reservation, and they didn't have his car. And he said, well, maybe you don't understand what a reservation is. She said, oh, sir, we understand what a reservation is. And he said, well, you understand how to take the reservation. Anybody can take a reservation, but you don't understand the most important part, and that's the holding of the reservation. And we can hear these lessons. We can hear God's word, but if we don't hold to that teaching, it's the same foolishness, right? Um, I think I might write a song called Cicada in the Kitchen. But, um, <laughs> as the singers come up, I'm going to pray, and uh, appropriately, we're going to close the service with Lord of All, or not at all. Father, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your word, to hear uh, the life, the second chances that we get with you. Um, we, we, we honor all of the fallen members, as, as Janice did earlier, uh, of our armed services that, that gave us these second chances. But God, you, you give us the second chance uh, that call us out of the darkness to, to call us out of our, our own sins over and over, and constantly second, third, fourth, fifth chances that you give us by your grace in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.